The Hudson Library and Historical Society presents Cultural Historian Mike Goodnow with his Beatles Week presentation Revolution The Beatles and the 60s Counterculture At the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on February 12, 2014 Now, here's Mike Goodnow Thanks for being here tonight. We are very lucky to have Mike Goodenough with us. He is a cultural historian at Kent State University. He very kindly agreed to come and talk to us tonight about the Beatles, the 60s, and counterculture. Uh, Mike Goodenough, thank you. All right, can everyone, oh, thank you. Can everyone hear me all right before I get started? Okay, well, I wanted to say thank you to Julia for having me uh, and the Hudson Library. This is a good event that they're putting on, and it's a good way to reach out to the community, so I'm really happy to be here. And I wanted to say thank you for that, and then also thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. And um, I appreciate that, and it's, I'm usually giving these talks to university students, so this is my first non-university setting that I've given a talk like this, so if I seem a little nervous or start to ramble or anything, let me know and I'll slow down. But another thing I wanted to go over is that after each slide, I'll, I'll ask if there are any questions or anything like that. That's just a habit of mine. So feel free to, to raise any questions that you might have. And as the, the title slide says, uh, this talk will explore the, the cultural and uh, pop cultural aspects of the, the 1960s and investigate how American citizens sought to change or challenge dominant and mainstream American cultural attitudes. Um, and this, this lecture will be divided thematically and chronologically. So first I'll uh, begin by tracing the broad contours of the 1960s, and then we'll step back in time and take a look at how the Beatles fit into all of this. So before I begin, though, I wanted to go over some goals of this talk. And we want to understand the economic and social aspects of the 1950s and the 1960s to see how citizens, mainly the youth, um, questioned the values and, and traditions of mainstream American society. You'll notice the 50s are important to this, and I'll get into that in a little bit. We also want to look at the various methods of dissent by America's flowering counterculture. So we want to see the ways in which they challenged uh, the, dominant, the dominant culture of the United States. We also want to look at the pop culture of the, of the 1960s and then learn about the Beatles' role in 1960s counterculture because you probably, if you've been to any of the other events this week, you've see, you probably saw that they fit into this or even in popular memory we tend to think of the Beatles as being part of this uh, broader countercultural movement. And then lastly, I'll conclude by gauging the effects of the Beatles on American society. Obviously, if a, if a library in Ohio is having a whole week devoted to the Beatles, they've obviously had a pretty uh, strong, strong uh, effect on the United States. But are there any questions before I get started? OK. We'll begin with the, the beats. And we need to understand that the historical memory that we tend to construct with the 1960s is a little bit one-dimensional. Uh, we tend to think of it as, in some ways, a self-contained event, and we want to avoid that. And, and what I'm going to try to do here is paint a more multi-dimensional portrait of the 1960s. And in the field of history, we don't think of uh, the 1960s as a decade, uh, starting in 1960 and ending in 1969. And instead, we have a, a concept called the long 60s. So this begins in the mid-1950s and goes all the way up until about the 1980s with the Reagan Revolution. So when I talk about the 60s, I'm not always specifically um, talking about 1960 through 1969. Instead, it's this kind of longer, broader cultural uh, aspect of the United States. And when we think about this, we can obviously get more of a rounded picture, and then that, that will uh, help us avoid kind of thinking in these strict terms of, of decades. But to begin, like I said, we want to go with the, the beats. and. The 1950s was a time of rapid economic expansion for the United States. After World War II, um, the United States economy was growing, um, and 
there was a lot going on in terms of wealth and, and a lot of people were getting into the middle class. And this economic expansion saw the rise of a mass consumerist society that placed value in the accumulation of material products um, in order to achieve the American dream. So there's this idea happening that's uh, a huge difference from before the 1950s that in order to uh, achieve the American dream, you need to have a job and you need to participate in this mass consumer ideology. And it's a, it's a sharp shift because a lot of people who uh, began to become a part of this were they experienced the Great Depression, which talked about being frugal and things like that. And we see this, this really interesting cultural shift in the 1950s. But for some, the mass consumer society began to be viewed as a, as a plastic culture that failed to acknowledge the, the true human aspects of life in, um, in America. And these individuals were known as the Beats. And they felt that, that there was a problem with this mass consumer society that was growing in the 1950s. And with many of the 1950s youth growing up during this time, uh, the pressures to buy into this, this system, um, it, it, it kind of took over and they started to feel a little bit odd about this and they started to turn away from the lives uh, that their parents were telling them to buy into and they wanted to pursue a more uh, fulfilling lifestyle and they found hope in this in the emerging beat movement. And the beats espoused unconventional values in their stories, poems, and happenings and attacking conformity they insisted that there were alternatives to mainstream uh, American society. And they rejected materialism, they engaged in overt sexual activity that was designed to shock mainstream America, and they helped popularize the consumption of marijuana. So we see this as a very uh, interesting shift that's going on with the Beats. And one of the most famous literary works of the Beats was the poem Howl by Allen Ginsberg. And the poem became a defining aspect of the Beat culture and inspired many youths to join the unconventional lifestyle uh, that he represented. And it was written during a wild weekend in 1955 while Ginsberg was under the influence of drugs. And because of that, uh, it became a scathing critique of modern mechanized uh, culture and its effects. And a lot of youth really felt this was an interesting poem, but he wasn't that popular at the time it came out. Uh, a couple months after it came out um, in print in 1956, it developed into a cult piece. And this was particularly after police seized the poem on the grounds that it was obscene. The poem underwent a trial, uh, and this actually helped uh, popularize Ginsburg, and he became this icon, and it did survive the, the court test. And I think there's probably still, the film is probably still on Netflix. It's called Howl. It came out a couple years ago with James Franco, and it reviews this whole process, the court proceedings that went along with the poem Howl. But another famous member of the Beat Generation was Jack Kerouac, and Kerouac types his best-selling novel, On the Road, released in 1957, describing a freewheeling trip across the, the country. And he wrote this on a 250-foot roll of paper. Um, and it lacked conventional punctuation and paragraph structure, and the book was an example of the, of the values that the Beats had. Uh, if you read any works by Kerouac, you notice that he doesn't really follow normal syntax and things like that in sentences, which really speaks to the, the whole point of the beat culture. And we'll notice then as this, this lecture goes on that a lot of these values of the beats, they, they are adopted by the 1960s counterculture. And despite seeking to challenge mainstream American society and this consumption identity, it was also the rise of this, this society and uh, ideology that allowed for their works and ideas to be broadcast to the masses. So this is a very interesting point because we see a mass consumerist society and at the same time it's what's allowing uh, these people to disseminate their ideas. So they're challenging it but at the same time uh, that, that mass consumer society is also helping popularize it. And like I said before, the Beats would furnish a model for the, the countercultural rebellion uh, once the 1960s starts. But are there any questions so far on, on the Beats? Yes. When you talk about the Beats, it's always Kerouac and Ginsburg. You know, there's Burroughs and, and Corso, but it seems like it's a very, very short list of, of, of actual producers. That's true, and, and Burroughs is another good example of this, this beat literature. And, and we do kind of have a, a tendency to focus on the prominent people, and that's, that's, um, that's a, a typical thing uh, in stories about the beat generation. And it was a small, self-contained 
kind of culture except for the actual literature and works like that that were spread out of the United States. It wasn't a widespread movement in the sense that there's you know, millions of Americans joining the beat culture like what would happen uh, with the, the counterculture in the 1960s. But you're definitely right that we tend to kind of um, only focus on a couple individuals, which is, which is sad, but there are a lot of historical works that look at the, the more social aspects of the of beats. Does that, does that help? I never heard of the beats. Is it the same thing as the Phoenix? Yes, in a way, it's, it's definitely, that's the, the shorthand version of that, and, they, and that's what they went by, and that's what they were called, so that was their, their name, The Beats. Um, there's a lot of literature on The Beats, and, and like I said, there's a couple films on them as well. That's always interesting to see how we, we look at them in, in current contemporary culture. Any, anything else? Is that how The Beatles got their name? Uh, the Beatles got their, we'll get into The, the Beatles a little bit later, but uh, Apparently, the Beatles got their name from a dream. Uh, I should actually know this. I think it was uh, Lennon who had a dream. It might have been McCartney, where he had a dream about this beetle on a plate or something like that. And he then decided, but it was spelled, it's not spelled like an actual beetle, but he saw this in his dream, and that was the, the, the way they got their name. I, I, it's a story. Is that made called? up? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So the a man came to him on a flaming pie and said, there will be beetles within a and thus we were. It's just made up. And Stu Sutcliffe came up with the name based on Buddy Holly's crickets. Okay, well, I'm, I'm learning, so that's, that's good. But, yeah, so, but there's no connection to the beat, the beat um, name itself, I don't think, though. If there is, I'll have to, to learn about that. But moving on, we want to see signs of cultural rebellion uh, that appeared in popular music. And parents recoiled during the 1950s as their children flocked to hear a young Tennessee singer named Elvis Presley belt out rock and roll songs. And Presley's sexy voice, gyrating hips, and other techniques uh, that were borrowed from black singers helped make him the, the undisputed, quote, king of rock and roll, end quote. And his black leather jacket and ducktail haircut became a style that a lot of uh, male teenagers adopted. So we can see this kind of countercultural value being shown by Elvis Presley. And 18 Presley hits sold more than a million copies in the last four years of the 1950s. And this is huge because, again, it explains how the mass consumer society was fueling cultural dissent while at the same time it was supporting it. So it's this interesting reflective or bi-directional process that we see at this time. And it's, it's really fascinating when you think about it. And we'll, we'll see with the counterculture in the 1960s that it was also sustained by this mass consumer uh, society despite the goals to reject this, this very system. And there was also a revolution in countercultural art in the 1950s. Uh, American painters shucking off uh, the, the European influences that had shaped American painting for two centuries, uh, they, they started to join this rebellion and they were led by Jackson Pollock and the New York School and they discarded the easel, uh, they laid gigantic canvases on the ground as you can see in the photo there and then used putty knives and sticks to apply paint even using pieces of glass throwing it on the canvas. So this is also happening during the 1950s and Known as abstract expressionism, these paintings uh, regarded the unconsciousness as the source of their artistic creation. And this is very interesting because for years, America had, had an interesting uh, role in, in the art world. And it had always been influenced, like I said before, by European artists. And there was always this idea that Europe was superior to America in a lot of ways in, in, in art. But with the New York School, um, Jackson Pollock kind of brought this American style to the world and it, and it was a form of uh, cultural expression at this time and like much of the the literature of the beats abstract expressionism reflected the artist's alienation from the world becoming filled with nuclear threats computerization and materialism so what we're going to do now is just take a look at, at my favorite Jackson Pollock painting called Autumn Rhythm. And this is Autumn Rhythm number 30. And if you notice down there the size of the canvas, it's, it's quite large compared to um, more traditional paintings. And like the beat writers, Pollock, Pollock's work shows this unrestrained style. If you remember back to what I said about Kerouac um, and his writing, it was very unrestrained. And, and in the same way, we can see that in this painting. So we're starting to get a an understanding now of the ways in which uh, 
uh, things like this and also beat literature tried to kind of shake up and shake up the tree, if you will, of what was considered acceptable. Um, and it also is a, is a critique, according to Pollock, of the, the rigidity of, uh, of American life. So it's a really, really interesting painting. And now that we've looked through the 1950s, very briefly, I just wanted to recap in the sense that I keep hammering home this fact that a lot of the cultural rebellions and the cultural challenges were uh, designed to critique American materialism and mass consumption, but at the same time, it's this very system that's allowing them to operate. So now we're going to get into the 1960s in terms of the decade. We're already in the 1960s culturally here, but we're going to start talking about my generation as the, the phrase goes. And the cultural rebellions of the 1950s helped jumpstart uh, these cultural rebellions of the 1960s. And the 1960s became a period of cultural and political revolution in America as the nation grappled with a, a variety of issues ranging from civil rights, um, gender rights, uh, all the way to the Vietnam War. So there's a lot going on during this time that, uh, that, that was happening for these youth to see. And with baby boomers coming of age in the 1960s, the attacks and critiques of mainstream America only intensified. So there's more youth at this time uh, than any other period uh, prior to this. And, and as they come of age and start going to college and things like that, they really start to grapple and question a lot of things that are going on. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to trace these contours, and then we'll step back and look at the Beatles after that. But are there any questions so far? OK. Well, we're going to look at first the hippies, which is a very um, traditional way of thinking of the counterculture. I know in popular memory, when we think of the counterculture, we think of, of the hippies. That's the, the standardized model. We'll also look at the new left, which has an interesting relationship with uh, the counterculture of the 1960s. And then lastly, black power, which is another countercultural movement of this time. And some of these cultural movements sought to completely withdraw uh, from society, like the hippies, they wanted to, to live in a co uh, commutarian uh, utopia, whereas with um, the New Left, they wanted to carve out the structures of the United States, destroy those structures, and then rebuild them uh, through Jeffersonian liberal democracy. And then uh, the Black Power Movement also sought to withdraw from the white community and form a nation within a nation. But I want to note that I will use the term hippies and counterculture interchangeably. Um, but I think we'll understand what I'm talking about. But they are the first people we're going to look at. And in the 1960s, many Americans, particularly the young, they did lose faith in the sanctity of the American system. And often drawing on the example of the beats of the 1950s, they sought new means of self-gratification and self-expression. And indeed, the, the self-destructive behavior and self-indulgence uh, became built into uh, this hippie movement. And surface appearances were the most visible to older Americans at this time, and also the most troubling. Um, as you can see in this photo here, men let their hair grow long and they sprouted beards. Uh, men and women both donned jeans, which was new for this time, and also they wore simple garments. And stressing spontaneity above all else, some rejected uh, traditional uh, marital customs and gravitated toward communal living and things like that. And their example, shocking to some, soon found its way into the culture at large, actually. So during the 1960s, we also see uh, businessmen beginning to wear their hair longer, not as long as this, but we also see them wearing uh, uh, beards and, and discarding ties and, and just wearing jackets, kind of like I'm doing today. Uh, women threw off confining clothing, like girdles, and embraced freer fashions uh, with mini skirts, longer skirts, and then slacks and jeans for casual wear. And interestingly enough, despite the hippies' hope to withdraw completely from society, this proved to be a difficult task for them. And like what occurred with the Beats, again, America's mass consumer society resulted in many of their ideas and styles uh, being turned into a hip consumer market. And there's a book by historian Thomas Frank called The Conquest of Cool. And if you watch uh, Mad Men or any of those shows about marketing, there's a, this book actually covers the ways in which uh, marketing people said, well, hey, this is, this is a new hip style. Let's take advantage of this and start to market clothing and things like that to the youth. So again, they're trying to withdraw uh, from American society, and then it's pulling them, them back in. 
so check out that book if you have if you have time. Uh, it's called The Conquest of Cool again. And also, sexual norms underwent a revolution as more people separated sex from its traditional ties to family life. A generation of women came of age with access to the pill. And Americans of all social classes became uh, more open to exploring and enjoying their sexuality. So by the late 1960s, sexual freedom had become as much of an element of the counterculture as uh, long hair and drugs. And like the Beats, the hippies did not seek to truly reform American society through politics. This wasn't a political movement. Uh, even though uh, some hippies participated in anti-war movements, we, we shouldn't think of, of the hippies as politically minded. They're more about just leaving politics behind. And, and that's an interesting point to remember. And they wanted to form utopian styles of living based on equality. Uh, they wanted to do away with hierarchical forms of power and, and try to create this, this utopia. And in other words, they, they were more so challenging the dominant culture of the United States rather than challenging the dominant political culture. And we'll get into challenges of the political culture with the new left, but that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and one of the ways that they, that they did challenge American uh, culture was through drug use, which we'll get into next. But are there any, any questions so far about the, the hippies? All right. Well, this is the, the trip, drug culture during the 1960s, which is another very popular memory that we have of the 1960s. We tend to think of hippies and, and the 1960s as this era where there's a lot of, of drug use going on, but there was a drug culture. And hallucinogenic drugs became part of this hippie and countercultural movement. And like I said before, the Beats and other uh, individuals in this movement had experimented with drugs but now their use spread to younger Americans. And one prophet of the drug scene was Timothy Leary, who was doing scientific research at Harvard on LSD. He was a professor, and uh, he really felt that LSD was an important uh, thing for people to use, and then he was fired for experimenting with the benefits uh, by giving it out to LSD out to undergraduates. And Leary aggressively asserted that drugs were necessary to free the mind. This was very important to him. We can see his idea uh, of transcendental philosophy that's, that's Eastern in, in idea. And, and with this, working through the group, the League for Spiritual Discovery, he dressed in long robes, uh, you can see his attire there, and preached the message, tune in, turn on, and drop out. So this was the thing that, that Leary was really, really all about. And you can see actually in, the, in that poster is their life after youth, which is a, an interesting poster to have. And another apostle of, of drugs and this drug culture during the 1960s was Ken Kesey. And Kesey is famous for writing One Flew Over the, the Cuckoo's Nest, which probably a lot of you have read. If not, you might have seen the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, and he wrote that um, in the 1960s. While, while he was writing the novel, he began participating in a medical experiment at a hospital uh, where he was introduced to LSD. And he began writing the novel then. And with the profits from the novel, uh, Kesey established a commune of merry pranksters near Palo Alto, California. And in 1964, the group headed east in a converted school bus painted in psychedelic colors. Uh, it was wired for sound, and it was stocked with enough orange juice and LSD to sustain their whole trip across the United States. And they freely gave out LSD to anyone who was willing to try it. And the road trip uh, enhanced Kesey's standing with many youths during this time. Um, there is a film on Netflix, again, titled The Magic Trip, which actually is a documentary about their experiences in the bus itself. And it's a really interesting uh, documentary to watch. But one thing I want to point out that we're talking about this dr dr drug culture during this time, uh, we have to, to understand that it was no longer confined to urban uh, subcultures of musicians, artists, and the streetwise. Now it was beginning to go into middle America, uh, outside of these urban areas, and taking a tab of LSD became part of a coming-of-age ritual for many middle-class college students. Uh, marijuana became phenomenally popular in the 1960s as joints of grass were passed around at high schools, neighborhoods, and college parties as readily as beer was of the previous generation. And soldiers also brought drug experiences back with them uh, upon their return from Vietnam. 
Uh, indeed, marijuana grew wild in the jungles of Vietnam, and heroin use also became common among soldiers who would become addicted to morphine. Vietnam is, was in a very, uh, it was in the, the triangle of, of heroin trade in, in Southeast Asia, so then they, they would, you know, once they became addicted to morphine, they would switch to heroin, then they would come back to the United States as an addict. So we can kind of see all of these different ways that, that drugs were, were being used at this time. And also during the 1960s, which is an interesting point, is that young professionals began to use cocaine, which we typically think of as a 1980s phenomenon, but this actually started uh, in the 1960s, of course, though it would gain more prominence during the 1980s. But although drug use during the 1960s is often romanticized by this contemporary historical memory, um, we have to remember that the majority of youth uh, during this time did not take drugs. In, instead, drug users made up a small minority of the youth population, and it was not until the 1970s that drug use became more popular uh, amongst the youth in terms of, of demographic numbers. So again, we think we romanticize the 1960s as, as this drug culture, as, as I'm doing here in a way, but it laid the foundation for the 1970s where actually drug use increased amongst the youth. But are there any questions so far again? Were hallucinogenic drugs and well, other drugs, marijuana, were those illegal? Marijuana was illegal uh, following uh, the jazz, it became popular amongst jazz musicians and there was a racial component to marijuana that it made people aggressive and violent. It was, uh, it was a rationalization uh, by white uh, policemen and things like that to kind of target black jazz musicians, whereas LSD was legal in the 1960s, uh, for most of the 1960s, so you were allowed to possess it and distribute it, uh, and then it became illegal later on. Actually, Dragnet, the, uh, the, the TV show, showed it, uh, they had an episode about a crazed LSD uh, hippie commune that went on a murdering spree, so that kind of in this popular memory, you know, made people say, well, maybe this isn't the, the safest drug to use. Um, but yeah, so LSD was legal, but marijuana was not. Um, any other questions? Okay, now we're going to get into music, and we're not so much going to focus on the Beatles yet. This is more of a teaser, but music became intimately connected with these cultural changes. Uh, the rock and roll of the 1950s and gentle strands of folk music gave way to a new kind of rock that swept the country and that became extremely popular. And the music of the 1960s moved beyond these syrupy ballads of the 1950s. And the rock and roll movement that Elvis Presley started and helped launch uh, began to end as this new form of music emerged. And as the United States confronted the challenges of the, uh, the counterculture uh, and the cross currents of political and social reform, new music became uh, connected to all of this and it's very interesting. And like drugs, music became a form of experimentation during this time and therefore music can be considered a form of cultural protest. Uh, many artists like Bob Dylan, Country Joe McDonald, and then of course the Beatles, for example, openly discussed the cultural rebellion happening at this time and they openly sometimes endorsed some of the values that hippies and other people had. So we can see again how important music is for this, this time period. And the music was most important on a mid-August weekend in 1969, where some 400,000 individuals gathered uh, for the Woodstock Festival. And this was in upstate New York, and some people shed their clothes at the festival and paraded around in the nude. Uh, some engaged in public lovemaking, and most shared whatever they had, particularly the marijuana, which seemed to be endless uh, to the police observing this. But since there were so many people, they weren't interested in actually enforcing uh, any, of the, any of the drug laws. They were more concerned that, uh, about crowd control and things like that. And supporters hailed the festival as an example of the new and better world to come. Other Americans, however, viewed the antics of the young with distaste. They deplored the uninhibited drug use, the nudity, and the sexuality, and this was all brought to their living rooms on nightly television news shows. So no matter how much proponents hailed the Woodstock Nation, much of America was appalled by this, and the festival only underscored the generational polarization at this time. As we'll also learn, the late 1960s, we see this generational polarization kind of come to, a, come to its zenith, and, and there's... There's even worry that this nation is going to split apart uh, because of some of these things. But 
The fears of, of conventional Americans seemed vindicated at the Altamont Free Concert some four months after Woodstock. And this is a commonly forgotten music festival because again it ties into this romanticization of what Woodstock was, but we forget about Altamont. And the festival was organized by the Rolling Stones and it was intended to be the Woodstock of the West. Uh, and Woodstock had been well planned. There was a lot of thought behind this and how they wanted to set it up. Altamont was not planned at all. Um, instead of normal security, the Stones hired a band of Hell's Angels, uh, and the spirit of Altamont was different from the start. Uh, the peace and joy of Woodstock were replaced by a lurking fear of what could go wrong with this new Woodstock nation. And what happened is there was a man in the beginning of the festival, he jumped onto stage uh, to dance naked to the music being played. Uh, he clumsily trampled over some people. And then this finally aroused the, the Hell's Angels who charged him with weighted pool cues and they beat him to the ground. And there's, uh, there's footage of this and it's, it's very brutal and you can see some of the Hell's Angels there uh, beating concert goers. And the violence continued when the Stones took the stage later that night. Uh, while the Stones were performing, um, only a feat from their performance, the Hells Angels beat a, a young black man to death, and that's also on film because they were actually filming this whole thing, uh, much like Woodstock. So other beatings occurred during this, this festival, and accidents claimed several more lives, and drug overdosed revelers found no adequate medical support as was available at Woodstock. So this is kind of the darker side of what the Woodstock nation was. In a lot of ways, it also kind of showed um, the Americans who were initially opposed to Woodstock that there is nothing useful of this new culture emerging. And there's another documentary titled Give Me Shelter that discusses Altamont and it, and it shows on film the chaos that took place. It's a little, it's hard to come by. Uh, I haven't watched it in a couple of years, but if you can get a hold of it, it's, it's really fascinating. There's probably clips of it online or something like that. But Altamont revealed to the nation that not all was beautiful about the counterculture, like I said, and it fueled arguments against the counterculture uh, by more conservative members of American society that this was a wrong thing to do. And again, it, it did show that darker side of, of the hippies and the counterculture. And in many ways, Altamont signaled the end of the utopian future that a lot of uh, hippies wanted to build. Some within the actual movement became disillusioned after Altamont and they thought, you know, what's going on? This is, this is very scary and things like that. So it turned off a lot of people because of the violence that, that they experienced at the, at the festival. And now that we've traced the, this broad narrative of the 1960s in terms of hippies and the counterculture and the drugs and the music, we're going to move on to the political realm now and explore the, the new left. All right, well, we'll move on to the, the new left. And despite the time of the 1960s being one with drug experimentation, free love, and psychedelic music, there was also a militant and radical cultural movement of use that they didn't seek to withdraw from American society. Uh, instead, uh, they weren't interested in the self-gratification of the hippies. They, they sought to destroy the American society or change it and then rebuild it for a new future. And out of the disillusionment of American society arose the radical spirit of this new left. And in 1960, students from the University of Michigan organized the Students for a Democratic Society, or commonly referred to as SDS, which is considered the first uh, true homegrown leftist movement because America's old left was heavily influenced by British leftism, whereas uh, the new left built its ideas on, on Jeffersonian uh, democracy and things like that, and they were more uh, American in spirit in terms of what they valued. They weren't interested in the old British style of leftism. And it, in 1962, then, SDS issued its famous manifesto, the Port Huron Statement, and this was written largely by Tom Hayden in Port Huron, Michigan. And the manifesto began with an overview of the economic situation of the United States that critiqued the middle class environment created by the 1950s. And it opens with, quote, we are the people of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort, housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably at the world we inherit, end quote. And the manifesto goes on to deplore the vast social and economic distances separating people from each other, and it condemned the isolation and estrangement of modern life. Uh, the, the manifesto is very interesting to read because they talk about this new 
uh, almost computerization of universities and things like that because there are a lot of GIs in college at this time or more, more people than ever before going to universities and they felt that the university was becoming uh, interested only in profits and not education. And actually today those critiques still uh, live on in a lot of ways as universities become even more interested in maintaining uh, profits and things like that. And SDS quickly became the largest leftist group in the country as more students became increasingly alarmed about the escalating war in Vietnam. Uh, by the mid-1960s, you see an increase in the war in Vietnam and a lot of students um, became worried about what this war stood for. They weren't actually understanding what was going on and then also some of them joined to shield them from potentially uh, being drafted. But then uh, later on when the, the 2S deferments, I think it was, when that was taken away, if you, were a, if you had lower than a 2.5, a lot more students then became even more alarmed that I could get drafted even though I'm in college. And in fact, the SDS chapter at Kent State University, which I researched in my, my MA thesis, was one of the largest in the country. And it was also one of the most radical in the nation. And, and the power of SDS was often experienced through student occupations of university buildings and intensive demonstrations. Actually, in 1968, the Columbia chapter of SDS took over the university briefly. Uh, where they held the president hostage for a short period of time. And this was all about a gym that Columbia wanted to build. And they felt that it was, uh, it was a racist kind of policy because it was going to kick out uh, black residents to build this, this gym. And SDS uh, staged these protests. And, and then they also did it against ROTC programs and defense research. Uh, at Kent State, for instance, SDS attempted to take over the university numerous times, and they often clashed with university officials. Uh, if you're interested in this, this movement, the university, because of May 4th, has extensive archives on Kent's SDS chapter. And it's really interesting because um, Kent State's Liquid Crystals Institute was intimately connected with the war effort. They were developing new technologies uh, to be used in Vietnam, which, which alarmed a lot of students. And then after they tried to take over the university, they were suspended, and they kind of went into obscurity at Kent. Um, but the, a lot of the students stuck, they stayed around, and then you get the, the May 4th uh, shooting that happened uh, for an anti-war demonstration in 1970. So if you're interested in any of that, the university has a lot of, a lot of neat documents. But the power of the student movement of SDS across the nation, it caused fear of those in power, and this isn't, uh, when I say power, this isn't like the hippies who were making older Americans uh, scared. This was actually the political and economic elite who were fearful of this because SDS was attempting to build this interracial uh, working class movement um, to actually start a revolution. And, and the FBI and, and other government agencies were closely monitoring this organization as they began to become more interested in the violent overthrow of the United States. Uh, instead of just demonstrations. Actually, then you get the weather underground that emerges out of this because in a lot of states, dynamite was uh, legal for anyone to buy. And the weather underground took advantage of this and conducted a series of bombings across the, the United States. So a lot of those in the, the political power were fearful that the country was coming apart at the seams and that there was about to be a new American revolution. So it's a very interesting moment in United States history. And the New Left was briefly a powerful force. Although the activists never composed a majority, radicals attracted students and other sympathizers to their cause until the movement fragmented towards the end of the 1960s and early 1970s. And, but while it was healthy, the movement focused on opposition to the Vietnam War, and it challenged the inequalities of American society. There's actually a lot of debate uh, in the historiography of the New Left. When does it actually end? What happens? A common uh, point is that by, by the time the Vietnam War is over, there's really nothing to have students rally around anymore. So it kind of dies off into obscurity, which is an, a, another interesting point. And the impatience and, and frustration often evident in student protest movement could also be seen in other areas of American life as political up, upheaval was accompanied by cultural change. So we see a lot of frustration, but then at the same time we see uh, political candidates kind of piggybacking or, or actually then opposing uh, the New Left movement where then Richard Nixon comes in and says law and order because he's seeing in the streets uh, 
uh, all of this, this violence and this uh, massive uh, demonstrations happening. So that's, that's an interesting point in this counterculture because we don't tend to think of the new left as connected to that. It's usually kind of separated from the counterculture in, in its own way. But I think it's important to kind of synthesize this as a broader cultural change that the youth in general, whether they were withdrawing from society uh, or becoming politically involved, were interested in changing uh, the problems that they saw with the United States at the time. So are there any questions on the, on the new left or anything like that? Did anybody from the new left go on to be somebody we would know? Uh, there's, there's a couple. Uh, Tom Hayden is still, uh, he, he does a lot of speaking. Bernadine Dorn is another popular figure. Uh, I think there's a couple that, that went on into union politics, became part of unions after the, the death of the movement. So uh, a lot of people involved with the New Left are still, still around. And s there's still some activists, particularly Hayden and, uh, and Bernadine Dorn, they still do a lot, especially when the, the Iraq war started. They tried to resurrect SDS and bring it back. So we can still see the, the effects of that lingering. <coughs> I know who you're talking about, and I can't remember his name, but he, his, I think he was originally from New York, and then his family moved to Akron or something like that. Okay. I see. Yeah, I don't remember his name. It escapes me, but he was definitely, a lot of people in Northeast Ohio were really involved with the New Left, which is interesting. I, d I don't remember his name, sadly, but that's a, that's a good point. Any other questions? I guess I could build off that. And, and the reason why Northeast Ohio was so important uh, for the New Left was, was its position. So it was seen as kind of a middle point between New York and Chicago along the highway. So a lot of um, activists, if they're tra the National Office of SDS was in Chicago, and if they're traveling back and forth, they'd often stop in Kent. Actually, there was a, a poetry professor who gave, actually gave uh, SDS the idea of the name of the Weather Underground because she was doing poetry on Bob Dylan's song, uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues. And there's that famous line, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And there were some SDSers that were part of her class and like, wow, this is a cool, a cool phrase by Dylan. So then they, they use that, that term. But any, any other questions on the new left? All right, we're moving right along. Um, now we're going to get into black power, which is another interesting countercultural movement in the United States. And the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in 1965 gave many civil rights activists um, the idea that racial equality uh, would, was now coming to the United States. Uh, this was a top-down, uh, these were top-down federal initiatives that protected civil rights. And actually a lot of the verbiage from these acts was taken from Reconstruction. So in history there's another debate, when does Reconstruction end? And a lot of people say with this. Uh, so there's the greater Reconstruction to give black Americans uh, better, better rights and things like that. But despite the passage of these acts, uh, racial discrimination remained in both the North and the South. So you could make a law on paper that said people were equal, but this discrimination was still happening on the ground. And there's a lot of literature coming out about the civil rights movement in the North because we tend to think of the civil rights movement as a Southern thing. We also tend to think of it as starting in the mid-50s with Brown and then ending with these acts, but the, the literature now is expanding and it's called the Long Civil Rights Movement and it incorporates Northern uh, racism and things like that. But MLK's nonviolent approach was challenged by younger blacks uh, who became tired of beatings, jailings, church bombings, and the slow pace of change when depending on white liberal government action. And one of those most responsible for channeling this frustration uh, into a new set of goals and tactics was Malcolm X. And although born Malcolm Little, he dropped his, his slave surname and replaced it with an X, uh, symbolizing his separation from his, his African ancestry. And he began to, to preach that the white man was responsible for the black man's problems and the black man's condition, and that blacks had to help themselves. So this is a radical departure from MLK's 
uh, message. In espousing black separatism and black nationalism for most of his public career, he argued that blacks must control the political and economic resources of their communities and rely on their own efforts rather than working with whites. So what Malcolm X is saying at this time is that if we depend on whites to help us, they're not going to. They're just going to put things on paper and change isn't going to happen. What we need to do is focus on controlling our resources and controlling our communities. And that's where you get this idea of a nation within a nation. Let's form our own uh, nation and break off. In many ways, like what the hippies called for, Malcolm X was calling for blacks to withdraw from mainstream American society and to create their own society and, and embrace their own culture. And his affirmation of blackness and his justification of militant self-defense struck a, a resonant chord, like the Weather Underground and SDS. Malcolm X was explaining, well, they, they can racially discriminate against us, but they can't take away our Second Amendment rights, so we need to begin arming ourselves. Uh, and he had a famous speech up in Cleveland where he said, the ballot or the bullet, and that was a message to say, you know, give us all of our rights or you'll get the bullet. But then towards the end of his life, after traveling to Mecca, because he was part of the Nation of Islam, he went on a pilgrimage and he saw black and white Muslims working together, and he began to change his views and said, well, maybe we can work together, um, and he broke off from the Nation of Islam, but then he was later assassinated by a black antagonist in 1965. But despite this assassination, his, his African-centered, uncompromising perspective helped shape the ongoing struggle uh, against racism in the United States. And one man influenced by Malcolm's message was Stokely Carmichael. And soon after arriving at Howard University, he took over the Washington, D.C. chapter of SNCC. Uh, SNCC was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that had existed uh, throughout most of the Civil Rights uh, era. And Carmichael took this over, and he participated in pickets and demonstrations, and he was beaten and jailed like many um, of those involved in the, the civil rights movement. And he became frustrated with this strategy of civil disobedience. Uh, he urged field workers to begin carrying weapons for self-defense. He explained that it was time for blacks to cease depending on whites channeling uh, Malcolm X's message and to make SNCC into an all-black organization. And his election uh, as head of SNCC from a national uh, perspective in 1966 marked a profound shift in the tactics and goals of the black struggle. Uh, SNCC became increasingly militant and radical at this time and revealed the split in the black liberation struggle. So once Carmichael takes over SNCC, uh, white uh, people involved with that are expelled from the organization and it becomes an all black organization. So it, it goes against kind of the things that Martin Luther King um, was arguing for just like Malcolm X and another interesting thing this is again in 1966 we're seeing the escalation of the war in Vietnam there's a disproportionate number of black Americans being drafted versus white Americans uh, so these these youth are, are starting to get a lot more frustrated and during an MLK march in Mississippi in June of 1966 MLK supporters sang the traditional freedom song we shall overcome which was usually used as a as kind of a community event. But Carmichael supporters drowned out the song by chanting, we shall overrun. And Carmichael began speaking during the march and said, quote, the only way we're going to stop them white men from whipping us is to take over. We've been saying freedom for six years and we ain't got nothing. What we're going to start saying now is black power, end quote. So you can also see another phrase used by, by Carmichael, move on over or we'll move on over you. And it's this idea get out of our way, and he's speaking to both MLK supporters and the, the broader uh, you know, opposition to the civil rights movement, and he's telling both, both of those uh, communities to, to step out of our way or we're just going to trample over you and we're going we're gonna to get violent. And besides SNCC, one of the most prominent black power groups was the Black Panther Party. Uh, founded in Oakland, California in 1966, it became notorious for advocating self-defense, and, and this was in response to police, police brutality. Uh, the Oakland Police Department is, uh, is very, it still is notorious for uh, some of its tactics used, and they, and they really stood up to that. And they demanded the release of black prisoners because of racism in the criminal justice system, which, which in many ways still exists today. And the party's youth, youthful members alarmed whites because they wore military garb, and they also ran health clinics, schools, and children's breakfast programs. So the Black Panther Party wasn't only a militant 
uh, wing of, of the civil rights movement, but it was also interested in social reform by sponsoring these things, setting up uh, schools and things like that. So it's an interesting point. But it, internal disputes within the, the Black Panthers and a campaign against the party by the police and FBI, uh, which actually left several leaders dead in shootouts, uh, destroyed the organization. Um, there are fragments of, of the Black Panther Party that still exist today, but uh, the power that it had in the, in the 1960s and 19, early 1970s was destroyed. So what we must remember is that black power differed greatly from the civil rights movement of MLK, which is how we traditionally like to remember the civil rights movement. So instead of calling for integration, uh, black power called for separation. And now we've traced the contours of, of all of these different movements. If we think back, again, we, went, we started off with the beats, we went to the hippies, uh, we went with the new left, and, and then black power. So now we're going to step back in time and see how the Beatles fit into all of this, because that's the point of this, this whole week here in Hudson. So we're going to go back to 1964 in February when the Beatles arrive. And for the better part of the year leading up to their arrival in America in, in uh, 1964, the Beatles had been adjusting to the hysteria that seemed to greet them wherever they went. Um, they were dealing with this fame that they have, and they had grown somewhat accustomed to uh, screaming hordes of teenagers, young teenage girls often, uh, as you probably know, would, would cry and things like that when they would go anywhere. And they also became accustomed to the cameramen and reporters that were following them around. And by 1964, they had conquered Sweden, France, Germany, and the UK, but they had yet to make a very large dent in the American market. So they're still uh, not as popular as they would become later. So. The Beatles were nervous at the prospect of finally visiting the United States. They didn't know what was going to happen. And it was a country that had seemed to react indifferently to their initial small label releases of singles like Please, Please Help Me and She Loves You almost a year earlier. And John Lennon says, quote, this is on the plane ride over, uh, quote, I know on the plane, o plane ride over I was thinking, oh, we won't make it, but that's that side of me. We knew we'd wipe them out if we could just get a grip, end quote. So, Lennon's a little bit nervous about this, and the Beatles are kind of scared about what's going to happen. And on February 7th, 1964, they land, uh, and the famous saying went, the Beatles have, have landed. And before the Beatles' arrival, like I said, they weren't selling too well in the United States, and most, much of their success was in the UK and mainland Europe. And when they, when they landed, they were greeted by hundreds of fans, and, and this is a very interesting picture from this, where they're, they're coming off the plane. And as you've probably been reading and seeing in the media, this was the first step to the Beatles taking over the mainstream market and then securing their long-term fame and success. But the main thing that interested the Beatles when they first arrived wasn't this, all of these cameramen or anything like that. It was actually in their limousine ride from the airport. And they noticed that in the United States, there's all of these radio stations that, that we don't even really think about. But in the UK, there's only one music, at this time, there was only one music station operated by the BBC, and they tended to avoid playing uh, style, the style of music that the Beatles played. So McCartney is telling the limo driver, flip through these stations, oh my God, there's all of this music being played on all these different radio stations. I think we might actually have a chance at, at getting a lot of success because there's obviously a thirst for music in the United States in a way that there wasn't in, in the UK. So. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to briefly uh, go over some of the albums, uh, just some of my favorites, uh, and we can kind of explore some of these, these albums and see how they fit within the 1960s. So I'm just going to start off with Rubber Soul because it's my favorite album by the Beatles. Um, and this was their sixth studio album, and it was released on the 3rd of December 1965. And Rubber Soul is a folk rock album and also incorporates pop and soul elements. Uh, and it was building on the beginning stages of the psychedelic movement in a lot of ways. There's a lot of great tracks on the, the album. I, I really like Michelle. That's a classic song off there. And then also there's the song Norwegian Wood, which made references possibly to, to drug use and things like that. And it was a, it was a popular album, and they recorded it uh, four weeks uh, in four weeks to make it ready for the Christmas market. 
So again, we can see how this consumerist society at the time, they're, they're buying into this by saying we have to get this out before Christmas so we can sell more albums. Uh, so that's another interesting point. Uh, but next we'll move on to an album that I don't like too much, but it is important. And that's uh, Revolver, and this is their seventh studio album. And this contrasts sharply with Rubber Soul um, because it had more power-driven electric guitars. And in some ways, the Beatles picked up on Bob Dylan's trend because Dylan went electric the year before. And the Beatles said, well, hey, we can do the same thing. We can have more uh, power-driven uh, guitars and things like that. So they picked up on that in, uh, in Revolver. So that's an interesting point with, with that album. And those are two, two albums that they're gaining a lot of popularity. But once we get to 1967, we see the release of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And by June 1967, the Beatles were arguably the most famous people in the world when they released this album. And it, it was a very interesting album. And music critic Langdon Winner captures this cultural feeling at the time. Um, because as, as we saw in the first part of this lecture, the late 1960s, we're seeing, um, this is right before Woodstock, of course, but we're seeing this growing uh, psychedelic expression with Timothy Leary and a lot of people like that. And you can see that reflected on this album in a lot of different ways. And in this Langdon winner, uh, he explains, quote, the closest Western civilization has come to unity since the Congress of Vienna in 1815 was the week the Sgt. Pepper's album was released. In every city in Europe and America, the stereo system and the radio played, what would you think if I sang out of tune, woke up, got out of bed, looked much older, and the bag across her shoulder, in the sky with diamonds, Lucy. And everyone listened, and at that time, I'd happened to be driving across the country on Interstate 80. In each city I stopped in for gas, the melodies wafted from some far off transistor radio or portable hi-fi. It was the most amazing thing I've ever heard. For a brief while, the irreparable fragmented consciousness of the West was unified, at least in the minds of the young." End quote. So we can see how important this was, at least to, to Mr. Winner. But he is capturing this, this cultural moment of the time when this album is released. It's extremely popular and is dealing with a lot of countercultural issues on this album. Uh, of course, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds makes a reference to LSD. Um, originally, they said it, it didn't, but then they later admitted that it did. So we see a lot of things happening with this countercultural uh, revolution happening and how it's influencing the Beatles. And to think back, in 1964, Newsweek had a cover story on the Beatles, and it dismissed them as a nightmare and as musically as a near disaster. Uh, so with Sgt. Pepper, the Beatles kind of won their wager, if, if you will, because the album did make these explicit references to drug experimentation and sexual freedom, and this angered older individuals and critics. But despite these references, the album forced even the most skeptical critics to admit that rock and roll uh, could be art and that it could be an interesting piece of art. So Sgt. Pepper's uh, is, is a very important album for the Beatles and it was right as they're becoming the most famous people in the world. And we tend to look at, at the way that the Beatles transmitted these uh, countercultural values, but we have to remember though, like we saw with Altamont, that the counterculture was not always interested in peace and love. Um, and by examining the White Album, we can better contextualize the darker realities of the counterculture. So we get into uh, the White Album with, with Helter Skelter. And this is, uh, this is an interesting point in the Beatles and, and American history, and also Beatles history. So in 1968, the Beatles released their ninth uh, and self-titled album, The Beatles, uh, or as we commonly refer to it as the White Album. The actual name of it is, is The Beatles, but it goes by the White Album. And this was written uh, at the top of their international fame after Sgt. Pepper's. They were expected to come out with a magnum opus after Sgt. Pepper's, and this is a two album uh, set. And, and they worked really hard on this, and a lot of the songs on the album were inspired by the Beatles' trip to India. Uh, where they, they explored and dabbled in transcendental philosophy to, quote, get away from it all, end quote, as, as Lennon recalled. And the retreat required long periods of meditation and isolation um, and, and to get away from these worldly things. But Lennon and McCartney, they quickly found themselves while they're doing this meditation and songwriting mode. So they would often meet in secret in each other's rooms at night and began writing a lot of the songs that would later be put 
onto the White Album. And as Lennon would later recall, he, he did write some of his best songs while in India. And since all of the songs were written in, in India, they came back and they began recording as soon as they retu returned home. And during the recording of the album, tensions within the band were a reflection in a way of the tensions brewing across the globe. And in fact, Ringo Starr quit the band uh, while they were recording this album, uh, protesting uh, creative differences and long working hours. He felt that they, that they were working too long, so he left the band, but then he, he came back in. And when the album was released, it immediately received uh, mixed reviews. Some re reviewers complained about the lack of political and social songs, um, but despite the mixed reviews, the album reached number one on, on the charts in the United States and Britain, and some commentators did regard it as one of the best albums ever made. But the interesting point about the White Album is, is one of the people that, who it uh, influenced, and that was Charles Manson. Uh, Charles Manson was on the scene, the countercultural scene uh, in California. He was friends with the, the Beach Boys, some of the Beach Boys, and they were trying to get him to become a musician because they really appreciated some of the music that he was making. But then he kind of, in a way, I don't want to be insensitive, but goes off the deep end and takes, takes this, uh, this hippie movement uh, at value withdraws from society out into the desert. And when uh, the White Album comes out, he felt that the Beatles were speaking to him uh, personally and that they were giving him a message that there was going to be a race war in the United States. So we see how Manson's being influenced by all of these brewing racial tensions with black power and things like that and also the social turbulence. And he's he believed that the Beatles told him to go out into the desert and he could wait out this race war that was going to happen. And then when, when everything was done, he would emerge with his family and then they would be in charge of the United States, or the world, if you will, because um, once the blacks took over, they, he felt that they would be incapable of, of demonstrating political power, so then they would ask Charlie to, to run the world, uh, which is, you know, it speaks to his, his egoism. Um, and the race war didn't happen, and he's sitting in the desert waiting for this to happen. And then he feels he gets another message from the White Album, is that he's supposed to start the race war. And the way that he's supposed to do that is by ordering the murder of white Americans and trying to frame it on uh, black power activists and social activists. Because with the Tate and uh, LaBianca murders, he had his uh, family write the word pig on the, uh, on the walls in blood, which references piggies on the Beatles album, but then also is some of the words that activists use. So when the cops would arrive, he hoped that they would think, oh, this is, this is done by uh, black power activists or uh, other social activists. And then he really believed that he was supposed to start this, this race war, but then he's arrested and, and put in jail where, where he remains in jail today. He does try to get, get on parole every couple of years, but he, he's, he's always denied. So, you know. It's an interesting point that Charles Manson was influenced by the Beatles in this way, and that it's, it's something that we, we tend to forget with the White Album, but it is an important part of that. I'm not trying to say that the Beatles are responsible for the murders or anything. It's just that uh, their music had the power to influence people um, in this way. And then another problem, as I mentioned before, is that some people were upset with the album because it wasn't political enough. Uh, some on the left were really hoping that the Beatles would come out in support of this, uh, this youth rebellion with Paris 68, the United States in 1968, but then you get the song Revolution, and uh, Lennon's talking about how he's not interested in any of this and he doesn't want to participate, so please don't make me uh, a part of this. So that's the White Album, and we're coming towards the end of the Beatles' career, but Abbey Road is next, and this is my second favorite album by the Beatles, and this is their 11th studio album, and it is their last recorded album, although Let It Be was released after this. So they recorded this last, but then Let It Be was released in 1970, uh, right before the band uh, fell apart in 1970. And it was mostly recorded in April, July, and August of 1969, and was released on the 26th of December in 1969 uh, for the UK, and then on October 1st, uh, in the United States, and it reached again number one in both countries. And there was a double-sided single uh, with the song Something and Come Together, both really great songs uh, that was released in October as well, which also uh, topped the charts in the United States. And like I said before, this is, this is while the Beatles are starting to 
not come together and they're starting to break apart because of creative differences. Uh, and then you get uh, the last album that they release, not their last recorded album, but Let It Be. Um, and, and this is the last actual album that they, that they put out. And then they went off to do their own um, solo projects. Of course, McCartney's still, still a, a pretty relevant figure and, and obviously they, they've still had an effect. But the point of this was to think about the ways that the Beatles, they really bought into the countercultural values in a lot of ways, but then towards the end of their career, they started to reject it. And in a lot of ways, they weren't always comfortable with the fame that they had. They understood their importance, but at the same time, though, they, they were more interested in kind of living their lives um, to the point where some of them went into seclusion. Uh, Lennon did that for a while, and, and also Harrison. But their effect is obviously apparent um, because of the fact that we're sitting here listening about the Beatles, and then that's getting us to think about other things that happened during the 1960s. So we can see the importance of this band on our popular memory. And they're still, they're still relevant today. A lot of people still listen to the Beatles. Younger people aren't opposed to them. It's still a, a style of music that isn't seemed old or, or something like that. So they still have a lot of power. And now that, now that it's already 8.10, I'm just going to do the, the quick recap. And what we did is we traced the various cultural movements of the 1950s and 1960s. We saw the Beats, the Hippies, the New Left. Black Power, et cetera, and we explored the goals of these movements. We saw that some wanted to withdraw from American society, others wanted to actually change American society. Uh, we considered the, the connections of the, the cultural movements of the 1960s to the 1950s. Again, we need to think that the 1960s is a self-contained event and that it's part of this broader cultural shift after World War II. Uh, we looked at some of the pop culture by thinking about Woodstock and things like that. And then we learned about the Beatles' role in the counterculture, especially with Sgt. Pepper's. That really solidified them as being part of the counterculture. And then we gauged the effects of the Beatles on American society, both through Charles Manson and then, of course, this, this very presentation itself. So that, that concludes it. And I thank you for coming. Are there any final questions or anything that you might have? Yes. Do you know if the Beatles were ever aware or Charles Manson sort of corrupted the, the White Album? I don't know that. Um, they probably did afterwards, I would think, but I don't think at the time if they did. I'm, I'm not too familiar with that. I know there's the book by Bugliosi, um, Helter Skelter, and, and it's probably in there, um, but I'm not sure if they commented right after that or anything, but they would certainly would want to distance themselves from, from that aspect. Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Production facilities for this program were provided by Hudson Cable Television, your window to the community. If you have comments or questions on this or any HCTV program, please leave us an email message at hctv at hudson.oh.us or call us at 330-653-2500. We'd love to hear from you.